This is Joel Kotkin. And this is Marshall Toplansky. And you're listening to the Feudal Future Podcast. Our society is being rapidly reduced to a feudal state, a process now being exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Millions of small businesses are near extinction. Millions more are losing their jobs, and many others will be stuck in the status of propertyless serfs. The big winners have been the expert class of the clerisy, and most of all, the tech oligarchs, who benefit as people rely more on algorithms than human relationships. With this, around the world, the middle class is becoming more squeezed than ever. And it's having profound economic, social, and spiritual implications. Here on the show, we're having conversations with business, government, and citizen leaders like you to get to the core of these issues and explore how we can work together to form a better future than the one we're headed towards. Hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Feudal Future Podcast. I'm Marshall Toplansky. I'm Joel Kotkin. And today we are delighted to have Batya Ungar Sargon with us. Uh, Batya is the deputy opinion editor of Newsweek. And before that, she was the opinion editor of The Forward, the largest Jewish media outlet in America. She's written for The New York Times, The Washington Post, Foreign Policy, Newsweek, New York Review of Books. Batya, welcome. Oh my gosh, it, you have no idea what it means to me to be here. You're both such leaders. And I think that uh, the courage to express my point of view, I feel very much is inspired by, but also um, supported by the courage that you both take in expressing yourselves in a media landscape that has become inhospitable somehow to liberals and lefties who want to talk about class, about the middle class, about the working class. So I just have to thank you both for the work that you've done, for the support that you give to people like me who want to express these things, who want to talk about these things, and just really for doing your part in forcing the American elites to confront uh, the consequences of their actions in the ways that you do every single day. So thank you so much for that labor. And thank you so much for having me. Well, well that's, that's very sweet pleasure. of you. And, and, and by the way, your new book, um, Bad News, How Woke Media is Undermining Democracy, gets at exactly the issues that I think has brought the three of us together to talk about, which is, you know, how the elites are kind of pre-programming everything that we're that we're consuming and how the alternative message, the 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 objective facts are not making it to the public for. So we're delighted to have you here. Um, I guess maybe one of the things that you deal with in the book and, and something that the, that our listeners may be interested in is why did this happen? How did this happen? I mean, those of us who I mean, I came out from the Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, and they always had a liberal bias to some extent, but nothing like what we have now. What's, what's your explanation for why this happened? It's such a great question. Um, and I would hesitate even to call it liberal because when it comes to identity issues, it's certainly very far to the left. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to economic policies, to questions of class, to questions of labor, it really is not that far to the left. And so, which as you both have pointed out in your work, and so I sort of hesitate to even allow that categorization to stand because, I, you know, like you both, I'm coming at this from a liberal, lefty, even socialist, pro-labor point of view. And so it's so weird to be out of sync with what the far left or what the progressive left cares about today. My explanation for why it happened was that the sort of woke, I call it woke, right? This moral panic around race, the woke revolution around identity that we're seeing now, um, you know, really across the liberal media, that this was the last stage in uh, a long-term status revolution among journalists. So, you know, if you go way back to the 19th century, um, to the dawn of really American journalism, what you'll find is there was a real populist revolution uh, in American journalism. You had figures like Joseph Pulitzer and Benjamin Day who felt very strongly that the purpose of journalism was to wage a crusade on behalf of the poor and the working class. And that is exactly what they did. 
Um, they charged one penny for their papers, told to raise it to two pennies, you know, by the 1890s. Um, and essentially what they did was they talked about the working class. They talked to the working class and they were written by the working class. They very much focused on class issues um, and they were able to get very wealthy doing that because surprise, surprise, there are a lot of poor and working class people in America. Um, and what happened was um, an alternative model sprung up that realized that they couldn't compete with you know, the Pulitzer model for numbers because they had a lock on this sort of you know, huge population of, of poor and working class, the masses essentially. So what they would do is they would do the opposite. They would restrict readership to the sort of more affluent to the business and political elites, and then they could charge more for ads, right? Which makes sense if you think about it, right? If you have an ad for a very expensive watch, let's say, right? And your newspaper caters to the poor and working classes, right? And maybe 1% of the people who read your paper will be able to afford that ad, that ad would be worth so much money. But if you can convince the maker of that watch that 95% of the people who read your paper are in the market for a $10,000 watch, suddenly that ad becomes worth a lot more. And the paper that really pioneered that model was the New York Times. And so the two models sort of ran side by side for a while. But by the 1930s, uh, when Pulitzer's descendants offered the New York Times his paper, the world, the circulation of his paper, basically for free, the New York Times declined because they didn't even want those readers for free. At that point, things had already slightly started to shift, but the real shift occurred. It started um, in the 1960s in the post-war era, really when you started to see the class divide start to emerge in America in the 70s, um, where uh, what happened was the newspapers increasingly across the board started catering more to the New York Times set to that population. Um, they started running coverage of work, the workplace more from a um, office worker point of view than from a laborer point of view. For example, when there were strikes, uh, transportation strikes, one, where once they used to cover those from the point of view of the striking workers, you really saw a shift in the 70s where suddenly they started covering that from the point of view of inconvenienced um, commuters, right? People who worked in offices. Um, it happened because of uh, television, right? So when you have TV, which provides a much more immediate uh, version of the day's news, the newspapers had to add something in addition to that. And what they added was interpretation. And that interpretation had to be written by people who increasingly had a college education. So, you know, things like this really created a status shift where more and more journalists had a college degree. Um, and it, but it really sort of amped up um, around digital media. Where yeah, you the, had... the, the, the digital media side is really has accelerated this dramatically. Absolutely. You know, the difference between mass and class um, you know, I, were, I grew up in the advertising agency industry. I was senior vice president at Ogilvy and Mather in New York. And I remember the days that you're talking about pre, um, <clears throat> pre online, when, you know, the, the mass versus class was the difference between say $5 a thousand for, for exposing your message on network television to everybody versus say 50,000 for an upscale audience. Today, with online advertising being even less expensive than what mass television advertising used to be, it seems to me that that it this exacerbates it even more because now you have um, the business model of the online news media reliant upon ever lower and lower cost content. So they're having consumers make the content themselves, which means mm -hmm. that in order for the elite media to be able to cover their costs, they have to charge quite a bit in order to have professionally created content, but there isn't enough, there isn't enough mass, there isn't enough throw weight in their audience to be able to <clears throat> make money. So the, the, the way that digital media has impacted this story is very extreme and very obvious. And, and I think you're totally right. A lot of it has to do with the way advertising works. Um, the main shift, and this has been at the elite institutions as well, has really been from measuring success in terms of, you know, say subscriptions or in terms of, you know, mass audience or advertising revenue. It is now measured in terms of engagement. And we know that the most extreme voices online are always the most engaged. So what that means is that the New York 
Times, the New York Times, right? The pinnacle of journalistic excellence is now measuring its success based on how well stories are doing on Twitter, how far they're, they're traveling, how many influencers are retweeting them. And as we know, Twitter is literally the worst place on the planet, right? So they've literally, the New York Times has outsourced journalistic and moral authority to the worst place on the planet. And that explains a lot about why you're seeing what you're seeing, because of course we can measure everything. We know exactly who's reading our stories now. It's all tracked in Google Analytics. We know how long they're staying on every page. We know where they're sharing, what they're sharing. We know what words they like to share. We know what words make stories rise on, on Google search. I mean, all this is measurable now and it's taken a lot of the guesswork out of it. Um, but it's also meant that the people that you know, the media is increasingly catering to are the people on the extremes of both sides as well. You know, it's, it's interesting because I, I think that when digital media emerged, we had the hope that this would allow for diversity of viewpoints that we had never had before. And there is some of that. And I, I have a piece today in, from Spiked where I talk about, you know, the rise of, well, actually people like Batya, you know, that, <laughs> that um, do not go with this, you know, party line. But, you know, I was talking to a, and I, I don't mean to, you know, generationally, we're a little different, but uh, a friend of mine who is a uh, very prominent member of the New York Times uh, said to me, he said, the problem in the New York Times is it's being run by 27-year-old gender studies uh, graduates from Wellesley. And, you know, basically everybody else goes around <laughs> scared that they're going to lose their job, they're going to say the wrong thing. And, and, and I, I wonder, um, in your estimation, and I know you talk about this in the book, is, is this canceling something that affects what journalists, even older journalists and, and those who still have some interest in reporting something other than ideology, um, is, is this something that, that is already affecting the news in, in your uh, estimation? I think absolutely. Yeah. I mean, as one New York Times uh, longtime editor told me, imagine that you had um, younger colleagues who were not only 10 times better than you at all of the digital media stuff, all of the social media stuff, everything that has such a high premium, but also if you say anything they don't like, they'll call you racist. And you'll imagine, you'll understand the fear that the sort of Gen X and older at the New York Times fear feel um, working there. And I, you know, I think you totally put your finger on it. You know, young people, 23 year olds with, you know, gender studies degrees are supposed to be wrong about everything, right? They're supposed to show up and demand that all anybody talk about is, you know, the crazy ideas that they picked up at the university, right? Like cooked up in these Ivy League universities, right? But there's supposed to be an older generation that has the courage to say, look, you know, it's great that you're passionate about this, but, you know, there's a sort of, you know, we, we have an understanding of what it means to produce the news, right? And that's what we're going to follow, right? And stick with us. And one day, you know, you'll be directing things. But instead, what happened was the older generation just capitulated because of all of these digital pressures. And I could just give you a few examples from the New York Times. So in 2014, the New York Times had a very bad year in terms of digital media. And so they were sort of trying to understand what they could do better. And they came up with this Times innovation report that was leaked to the media. And in the innovation report, they very explicitly, and this was, by the way, helmed by the current publisher, A.G. Salzberger, right? Not some like nincompoop in like audience development or whatever, right? It was like, you know, the head of the place was like, this is what we need to do. And the prescriptions he put in place were number one, get rid of the Chinese wall separating business from, from editorial, right? The, literally, this is in the report. He said that um, the newsroom has to be in charge of growing the audience as well. And number two was we need our reporters to be out there on social media, getting big profiles and tweeting their stories. Like there's a line in the report that's like the report, the people who wrote the report, they're like horrified to learn about a journalist who didn't tweet about his article for two whole days. Right. So essentially what they did was they actively pushed their journalists to become social media stars. Now their journalists have a quarter of a million followers on social media. And when they get annoyed at their own colleagues, they tweet about it and they, you know, create these huge storms and personnel decisions decisions are now being made in accordance to these sort of social media storms from, you know, New York Times' own journalists. They sort of created this beast in a way um, by, by, by following where the digital media um, promise was. And I, first of all, it, you know, from a business point of view, it's being, it's been extremely successful, right? 
So like that, let, let no one say that this isn't good business. It's great business. It's just terrible, terrible journalism. Right. And, and, the, and the point of this is exactly what you're saying. And that is that the metric has changed. Yes, exactly. The metric that's driving all of this is in fact engagement. And so the old metric, which was um, awareness and breadth of exposure, um, has been replaced, thank you, Google, right? Because they basically revolutionized this, this whole calculus for advertisers. What Google basically said was, hey, look, instead of advertising to every potential life form on the planet, why don't you just advertise <laughs> to the people that are interested in you? And if you're going to be measuring who's interested in you, that means engagement, right? Go, advertise to the engaged. Exactly. And so if that's where your if that's where your calculus is going to be, then of course that's going to be the right answer from a business perspective. So my question to you is, if the whole economics of the industry have changed, why are old journalists so outraged at this? They were <laughs> part and parcel of the old economics, right? They were part and parcel of, hey, let's tell a broader story with all sides represented so we can get as maximum exposure at, for people. Well, okay, game has changed. Now it's engagement. So now it's all about... Um, uh, what do you do to have to keep people on the hook? And of course, polarization plays right into that. So why why would people be upset about the game changing? Do you think journalists are upset? I, I'm so heartened to hear that. <laughs> well, I think I think people of an older, well, the question is really, how do you define a journalist? If you define people <laughs> like Joel, you know, and me to some extent, you know, who are close to being legally dead, um, you know, we have an old... <laughs> We have an old way of looking at it with an old set of uh, old set of standards and values. And yes, I think we're upset about it. We're upset about not having the exposure of the message. Are young people upset about it? I don't know. You tell me. I think the problem is they're not. Um, I can tell you why I am upset about it, but um, I often feel very lonely caring about this. I'm upset. I'm upset that to be watching in my lifetime the right be the only people speaking up for the working class because <laughs> yeah. they don't care about them economically, but all they have to do is not insult their values. And suddenly they're, they're going to vote. Like the, the left is offering them so little that they're now all, you know, streaming. And I'm talking about like the working class of all races, you know, like, right. um, so I'm very upset about that because the right is not going to take care of them and the left has abandoned them. You know, I often say like when I, when I go on, you know, conservative to talk about my book on conservative outlets, I say, you know, the message of my book is not that the left is hypocritical. We're all hypocrites, you know, like everyone is a hypocrite. That's not the message of my book. The message of my book is that the left has abandoned the very people who need them the most to the right who's like not going to do anything for them. Right. And I think that um, Joel, from your book, like one of the message that messages that really, really touched me deeply. And I think is so true is that, you know, it, nobody's offering a pro working class platform. You know, the left is offering sort of, you know, expanded versions of welfare. Well, you would have more and more people sort of living at the beneficence of the liberal elites. The right is always offering their crappy trickle down that doesn't work, right? But nobody is offering the working class an active role in building up this nation through good jobs that give them dignity, which is what they want, which is the, where the stability of a democracy lies. And I, so I am totally outraged by all of this, but I feel, I feel that many people think that the biggest problems in America are about political polarization and about race. And um, I, I would love to know why you guys think that is because I, I feel sort of caught between two explanations for that. Like, so, so the, you know, just in terms of the narrative. So you asked in the beginning why I think this happened, where does all this wokeness come from? I think it's just the latest stage of journalists status revolution. Like at some point, you know, the, the intelligentsia in America became very affluent. I mean, that wasn't supposed to happen, right? Like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you know, you would have like college professors and journalists living next door to cops, right? And that meant that not only did they know what cops thought, but they, you know, they were making, you know, they were making more than cops at that point already. But, you know, America was still much more integrated in that way. And the intelligentsia was not, like, it's very strange that that happened. You know, Thomas Piketty, of course, calls it, the, you know, the Brahmin left. Right. The, the, the intelligentsia has become affluent. Fluent. And and so to me, this whole woke narrative, a, a moral panic around race really actually does 
protect their economic interests because it allows them not to speak about class, right? It allows them not to speak about this huge class chasm that you both have written about so beautifully that is just perpetuating the disgusting levels of inequality that, that's being perpetuated by the left, right? So I guess my question to you guys would be like, why do you think that this has happened? Like, why do you think that so many people have become convinced that like race is where like the real struggle for the future of America lies as opposed to class? I, I would say I would take this on two levels um, on the grassroots, if you will, level. Um, I think there's a lot of um, people who who come to university and the university, which both Marshall and I are involved in, that <laughs> is, you know, probably been the progenitor of much of this. Although I, I will make a quick uh, statement that Chapman has done a great job so far of, in maintaining um, a uh, you know, I think I think you know we're you know we're blessed with with a great president, and I think that really helps us. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the long term. the The problem is that what I see on the on the sort of sociological level is that you have people who are, as as you mentioned, they're completely separated. You know, when I worked at the Washington mm -hmm. Post, mm -hmm. the guy next to me who was a bit of a drunk anyway, but his <laughs> his uh, his brother was a Baltimore city cop. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And he had mm -hmm. sort of a a sort of basic um, uh, sort of knowledge of mm -hmm. everyday life. My my mm -hmm. colleagues, particularly the older ones, they owned homes, they had kids, they mm -hmm. paid mortgages. Um, mm -hmm. They were you know they were sort of still sort of normal Americans right. who their craft was journalism. When journalism became a profession. And I remember when I was at the Washington Post, I mean, uh, Ben Bradley, I, he looked at me like because I, I didn't go to Harvard, I went to Berkeley, that I was some sort of savage from the woods. You know, I mean, it was like, and, and what, what we saw is sociologically, yeah. the paper changed. Now, the, the, one of the great journalists in America, my former boss, Lou Cannon, Lou didn't go to college. Yeah. You know, and yet he learned the hard way, just like, people yeah. like me i learned i covered the berkeley and oakland city councils the first things that i did that experience isn't isn't taking place what we're seeing at elite journalism is they all go to the same ivy league schools yeah. basically they have the same you know ideology and they have the same class so that's on the grassroots level the other level is i think very cynical on some levels which is if i'm mark zuckerberg and or i'm Jeff Bezos, I don't talk about wealth and class. That's bad stuff. But race and gender and transgender, even better. You know, we can so that now we can now uh, believe that the, that the new proletariat may be a transgender person with with a with a with a Harvard uh, degree. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. But you know, but you think about it. In a way, it's kind of, um, if, if I'm going to be cynical about it, it's a little bit of externalism, externalizing the enemy, in a sense. If yeah. you look at who is doing really well in society, yeah, it is the technocentric um, new economy people, right? The amount of wealth that is being concentrated, and it's not just Zuckerberg, it's it's the entire tech sector, is is concentrating wealth like nothing since the 1890s, right? So of course, they're not going to want anything to screw that up. Yeah. They need something to be able to divert. And, and you know what? Um, dystopia sells eyeballs. Yeah. Dystopia sells engagement. What I find fascinating about your point of view, Batya, and, and the question you asked, is why is it that the, that the, um, the left is not providing a compelling positive vision mm. of where we could go. Mm. It is really focused on what's wrong. And that's what that's the wokeness that is getting portrayed in the media. And totally. we're not seeing a positive vision. Look at look at the Biden presidency thus far, right? There was such for a moment there, there was such great hope when he came in, especially after you know the previous uh, nut job that was in there um, <laughs> of be able to create some kind of some kind of positive vision, and it's now you know the media has focused on the dystopic dysfunctional dysfunctionality 
of the political system. Why is that? I'm convinced that, you know, when you have guys like Jeff Bezos owning the Washington Post um, and the other, the other tech people, in essence, owning social media, which is the media, their focus is, oh, let's externalize the enemy. Let's, mm-hmm. let's not really, you know, highlight uh, what we're doing, because if we invite that scrutiny, people will start regulating us. I mean, now I'm just thinking in conspiracy theory terms, but like, yeah, like the worst thing for for big tech would be for both sides to realize how much of a problem they are, right? To have Elizabeth Warren and Josh Hawley come together on, you know, some of this, you know, legislation against big tech, right? So they're sort of very invested in discord, but I think that's a bit, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's not conspiratorial, but I I tend to think not when it comes to big tech, because those are corporations, like when it comes to individual journalists, I think it's very important to keep in mind something that's very difficult to keep in mind, which is that these people really think they're on the right side of history. Like they're not sitting there probably like, you know, Zuckerberg or whatever being like, you know, like this is how we get power. This is how we distract. This is how we keep accumulating. This is how we make, you know, over a hundred thousand dollars a year for a job that requires like sitting in your pajamas, right? Like they're not thinking that way. It's, they really do believe that this is the great struggle of our times. And, but at the same time, I think if it cost them more, they would not believe it so strongly, perhaps would be a sort of generous way of, of saying it. Um, I do have to stand up a little bit for the Biden administration, because uh, like, I think you exactly pointed out, it's like the media is obsessed with this, like Democrats in disarray when what they're actually doing is governing, like what they're actually doing is like, negotiating over a really big spending bill that's going to probably have a, you know, a decent impact on middle class families, hopefully, you know what I mean? Like we've done for for 200 years of of governing, right? It's all about 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 the art of Right, like, exactly, like, but sort of stop, there sort of does seem to be this sort of crisis in governance where sort of, you know, nothing happens. And, you know, because it's all happening on social media, and it's all about becoming like a social media star. So I do have to stand up for that a little bit. And and, uh, Joel, just to your point about, yeah, the status revolution among journalists, So, you know, in 1937, um, um, Leo Rostin did a survey of, you know, the elite journalists, and these were the elite journalists in Washington, and less than half of them had a college degree. Um, You know, half of, not half of them, but about, you know, 10 or 12 of them hadn't gone to high school. You know, it was a trade. It was a trade you learned on the job. And today it is this elite caste that you, like you said, you know, you have to, because of the collapse of local journalism, the only way in now is through the IVs, is through these sort of like very selective universities. And then, you know, you, you have to go, let's say, to, to, to get these like increasingly small number of jobs, you have to have take a free internship, you know, or an internship that pays $1,000 if you're lucky for three summer months in New York City, right? I mean, somebody has to pay for that. It's become really a rich kid's profession. That's not to say that there are zero exceptions to this rule. There are, you know, there are a few working class kids who have made it up, but really it's a rich kid's profession now. And you're that, like, wokeness is a rich kid's game. I mean, so many of these ideas are like utterly foreign to, 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 to the working classes, no matter who the working classes are voting for, right? Like the lower classes, no matter which party they vote for, like they don't agree with these like woke ideas that are cooked up in the Ivies. Yeah, one of my favorite cases, and our, our good friend Carla and I have talked, uh, uh, who we work with, um, who is from Mexico City, she said, like, Latinx. Like, <laughs> you know, she said, but it sounds like Kleenex to me. You know, I mean, it's like Latinx, no Latino thinks of themselves as Latinx. Oh, yes, 3% or 5%, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, so this yeah. idea that the media can then sort of... Um, define reality without any yeah. test as to you use Latinx, even though it's not used, or if you take, uh, let's say the pandemic or the, or, or climate change, I, you know, basically their level of skepticism and fair, um, even hand, handedness, or even like the write a story, the world is coming to an end. Now, maybe there are 500 scientists who will say, well, that's not really what's going on. But but this is the story. This is the narrative. And that what you get is that people adopt the narrative and that's it. So if I open up a New York Times story on climate change, I know I'm not going to hear from Bjorn Waldenborg. I'm not going to hear from Steve Coonan. I'm not going to hear from Roger Pilkey. I'm not going to. These are people who are very qualified. And the same thing with 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 um, COVID, 
Look how long it was that we couldn't even talk about the lab, the possibility yeah, that yeah, it, yeah. it, it right. came out of a yeah. lab. I mean, the fact that we have seen people with PhDs who are distinguished scientists at Cambridge and Stanford and Harvard and had them essentially wiped off the media. Um, I think what, you know, and this is something maybe to really, you know, sort of focus on as we, you know, get towards the end here. And that is, okay, here's the situation. We know the media is hopelessly biased right. and, <laughs> and that the reporters are mostly, you know, incredibly uh, ill-informed and don't even think that their job is really to get the reader to understand the complexities of an issue. What do we do? What's the alternative? What, how do we not, not fight back the way the right-wing media talks about, but how do we uh, go to some higher standard of journalism? Because we live in an information age and an information age with crappy information is not going to be very pleasant. Well, I, I mean, so you're not going to like my answer, but my answer is like, why do we have to know everything? Like, I, I think the problem is like this addiction to information. Like, why does everybody have to know where exactly the uh, infrastructure bill and the and the uh, bill back better is at at every moment in terms of the right. negotiations and which progressive is angry at this moment and which moderate is angry at that moment? Like, why do we have to know everything? Like, I I, I really sort of reject that. I think people need to like. Yeah, the media is hopelessly biased. It's hopelessly biased in favor of the rich. That's my problem with it. Is like it, the media has always been partisan. Partisanship is not a problem if everyone, ha if you know, you have the biggest newspapers are catering to the poor and the working classes. It's not a problem, right? It's a problem that all of the media, just like all of our politicians, are only speaking to the top ten percent, either the liberal half or the conservative half, right? Like that's the problem. And like I don't know. I mean, that's the capitalism led us there, and so I don't know. Like none of us are going to be able to change the media, the incentive structures there. Like I'm so <laughs> I'm religious. So I'm like, the, the only way to fix this is to be a better person is to like, you know, get out there and be nice to people who you disagree with, like find spaces where you meet those people become what you guys are, which is part of the, the, the labor for stitching back together the fabric of American society become convinced that the common good matters more than anything else. And that we share so much more than actually divides us. I mean, to me, these are like the principles that will save us. I'll just say one more thing, which is that when you're online and you're reading something and you feel that surge of rage, Someone is making money, like someone is making millions of dollars every time you feel that rage. Do That's not engagement. let them, don't let them make that money on your heart. Like don't make them, don't allow that to happen. Don't let your heart become the battlefield of somebody else's like horrible, you know, like corporation. You know what I mean? It's like, you have total power to stop them from doing that by like working on yourself and being a person who respects people from all points of view. I, I don't know how to fix the media, but I know that we can all become better people and like learn how to treat each other with respect again. <laughs> well, you know, if you think about it, if you think about what you said in kind of a more in a populist sense, right? In a way, the fix is already happening. And that is that the people are paying less attention to the media. Totally. Yeah. You totally. Know? And so what they're doing is they're totally. talking to themselves, right? We're, we're witnessing because of social media and access of, of humans to, to different types of content, <clears throat> a gigantic tower of Babel. Now, and, and, and I'll just say, I'll, yeah, I'll just add to that, which is we're seeing um, unions full of conservatives going on strike. You know, the fact that the media has abandoned the working class doesn't mean that they've forgotten how to stand up for each other. Like they are learning how to do that without us. You know what I mean? And like, right. that's great. Like we're seeing a huge revolution among workers. I hope that it will be successful, at least like to the extent that they continue to have leverage because of the pandemic. Like, I think that's really amazing. And again, I, I think like, if you care about class, if you care about inequality, like you have to learn how to respect conservatives again, because the working class is conservative for a host of socioeconomic reasons. And like those points of view that you are deplatforming by saying, you know, this puts New York Times journalists in danger, like the least among us, the poorest Americans hold those views. And so what you're essentially saying is it's illegal to be poor, like those points of view cannot be heard, cannot be seen. And that is a huge problem for anyone who is on the left, for anyone who sees themselves as part of, you know, the, 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 the you know, the labor force trying to trying to bend that moral arc towards justice. Well, you know, I think the, the, the key issue may be that that 
maybe the, the ultimate solution is what we're doing right here, which is, you know, you're doing the books. You know, I, I found um, in my experience with neo-feudalism, which, by the way, I think is hardly a conservative book. I mean, it, it's not at all. You know, the analysis is, if anything, more Marxist than than totally than, than free market. But what I found really distressing and you will, too, I'm sure, which is the mainstream media, if you're not if you may be with them 50 percent, but if you're not with them 100 percent, you go into the digital gulag. And but it's also which 50 percent, the only 50 percent that matters are the identity issues that are alien to the working class of all races. Right. right. Like if, if you're a free market person who's totally woke, everyone will have you on. You know what I mean? Right. It's like right. exactly. <laughs> And, and by the way, Joel, it's their digital gulag. It's not <laughs> the digital gulag, right? In the sense that, 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 that everybody still has a platform out there, right? Unless unless you're really egregious and they turn you off from Twitter, which only happens occasionally, right? But which is horrifying in and of itself. But the point is that you still can kind of get your message out there without having to deal with the media's digital gulag. Well, and that's, and this is the, the, maybe to end on a optimistic note, I was very pleased that um, one, that when uh, the book came out, we were able without the mainstream media to actually do very well sales wise, Mm -hmm. Um, that there were platforms, um, mostly conservative. What's interesting to me is, and I don't have an explanation for it, but conservatives are more than happy to deal with the fact that you disagree with them. I do right wing, uh, uh, and you'll find the same thing. I'll do a right wing show, and I'll say, you know, I I call Donald Trump Doctor Demento. I mean, I think, <laughs> I, I think he, you know, he, you know, he's he's almost certifiable on some mm-hmm. issues, but you can you can do that on in the left. I mean, I used to do NPR all the time. I almost never do it now. Oh, that's terrible. I used to do PBS. I actually oh, worked for people. Sure. Now, it's like you you don't exist. And what's so what's oh. happened is that we have we on the one hand the mainstream media, and I think I think it will hurt them in the long run. I think that you know having the distrust of the vast majority of the population, including about half of all Democrats, probably not a good thing. But I think it's going to be alternatives t- to this media. And that's what we're doing today. That's what your book is about. And that's what this whole new and I think wonderful group of liberally oriented journalists who are standing up, whether it's Bill Maher or Glenn Greenwald or Barry Weiss. The fact that we have that is is a sign of hope, as is your book. Well, And the book, by the way, is Bad News, How Woke Media (laughs) is Undermining Democracy. Baccio Ungar Sargon, thank you so much for an illuminating conversation, just tremendously engaging. Um, and of course, we're not necessarily using the word engagement anymore because we know it has economic <laughs> negative. But in the real world, meaning of the world of the word engagement, thank you so much. It has just been a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor.